Coming to you live from the Cultural Hall, this is the Mormon News Report for the week of December 11th, 2017. We are your weekly dose of Mormonism. Where the snark game is savage, the clapback is on fleek, we are fully woke, and Brian, we are ready to get turned up. Brian, I don't know, I don't know where you're getting this stuff from, Brian. Do you, like, do you seriously like, think about this all week long, like what you're going to say next? <laughs> this is, I don't know how to describe it. This is the highlight of my week, and this is one of those where I was thinking about it going, how many phrases can I throw in there that's going to really mess you up and have you saying, I don't even understand. Are you speaking English? What does that even mean? <laughs> WTH, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. I got, I got to say, Brad, this, it's kind of sad that this is the highlight of your week, though. Can I say I, that? There, there's not much going on in my life right now. How's that? <laughs> so listen, our guest for today's show is the one and only Fiona Givens. Uh, we're going to be chatting with her about her new book, The Christ Who Heals, How God Restored the Truths That Save Us. This is published by Deseret Book. But before we get to that, we're doing video. Here we are. Yeah, well, I mean, at least for this portion of it anyway. So we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing with the, uh, with the video. Um, but first, before we go any, uh, in, into the news this week, we've got some feedback from our question last week that we threw out that we should get to. And of course, we've got tons of articles to discuss this week. It's it, Brian, it's almost become like a broken record at this point. It's going to be an easy week. Oh, wait, no, it's not. It's going to be a really packed week, and everyone better buckle in. But before we start digging into that, there is one small piece of administrative stuff that we need to take care of. We talked back in October about the Katie Snyder Evans Memorial Fund. We advised everybody that if you donated to our Patreon, that all the funds that we received from the month of October would go to the Katie Snyder Evans Fund. Well, I finally had two extra minutes in my day to take care of everything. We made a donation of $27 to the Katie Snyder Evans Memorial Fund. We're going to include a copy of the receipt of that in the show notes, but we want to thank all of you, our loyal supporters, for thanking you. Or we'd like to thank you for, for doing that because... It really meant a lot. Brian, you and I both had known Katie through different online interactions, and it was just a tragic story. And we're really proud to see all of our listeners come out in full force and really help out everything that they're doing. So what we're planning to do with the video, and we'll get, again, we'll talk more uh, later about this, but we're planning on putting at least the news portion of the videos each week up on Patreon, up on Facebook, up on YouTube, because everybody needs to see Brant's basement. It's, it's gorgeous, isn't it? <laughs> everybody know, needs to know that Brant lives under the stairs. It's kind of a Harry Potter thing. Yep. And everybody needs to see my, uh, what do you say, on fleek toy collection. Your, your, your Funko Pops back there are making me very jealous, Brian. How's that? <laughs> and, and I'm representing Star Wars, right? Because we've got the next, uh, the next installment coming out at the end of this week, Brant. I'm mm -hmm. excited for that. It's, it's, believe me, I, I have been, this is something my wife doesn't get into this too much, but that's all I've been hearing for the last month is Brant, you've got our tickets, right? You've got our tickets. And I had to tell her today, I don't have the tickets yet. So I'm oh, yeah. the tickets this week. <laughs> so uh, should we jump into last week's question? Oh, let's do it. So last week's question, we had the uh, founders from Mormon Leaks on, and there have been a couple of stories going on recently about them. We got a lot of feedback about them coming on. And the question is this. Are the group Mormon Leaks helping the church to become more transparent, or are they just tossing gas on a fire? And that is an intentional play of words. Uh, but Brian, it's something that you and I, even privately, have been discussing back and forth. Um, would we want them to be involved in the show at some point? Do we want to give them some airtime? How do we want to interact with a lot of the things that we're doing? Because even though I would say personally, they are very nice dudes. We've been talking with them all week, it feels like. Um, but at the same time, we have some philosophical differences. And so we, we don't know how to react to some of that. And, and we didn't know if it was just us or if it was other people who were having some of these same thoughts about them as well. So we threw this out there. And, and Brian, we got a fair amount of feedback, didn't we? we got, yeah, we got a lot of feedback. So we're going to kind of power through this and then maybe save our commentary towards the end. How's that? Let's do it. All right. So let's start off with Brittany Hartley. She said, I wonder if the presence of WikiLeaks, uh, WikiLeaks, is, and, uh, by the way, is uh, Mormon Leaks wiki page where they, where they put all their stuff up. I wonder wait, if wait. The, I thought WikiLeaks was the uh, Julian Assange organization. Oh, is that the Julian Assange? That's right. They have a Mormon WikiLeaks uh, yeah. specific to this. You're right. I wonder if the presence of WikiLeaks will have the opposite effect to transparency. I wonder if having a watchdog will only force leadership to make decisions in a bunker where it's safe in order to hide from the people that unanimous does... Uh, does not always mean everyone was on the same page. Nick Gallietti said, what they are doing is illegal and certainly not a work of honor. Transparency is not always a high ideal. People 
and private organizations have a right to privacy. It is not the power of authority of some random website to take upon themselves the distribution of those rights as they see fit. Isn't it ironic that a site that promotes transparency takes in its information anonymously or secretively? It is hypocrisy and wrong, whether done to the church, the government, or a private individual to steal and then, and then profit thereby, even if the profit is masked as social currency. Carl John Martin said, it is not simply document release, which is in fact not their duty or right to make. It is the selection of which documents to release and those which they'll highlight that prevents the picture they intend. They likely don't have all the documents related to a given issue and highlight those which they do to shape a narrative. They're writing a story, in other words, with an editorial process that makes their point veiled as a simple exposition. It is rather creative in substance, or so it appears from the cheap seats. Chad Frankham said, to me, they seem to poke the bear more than being constructive or helpful. And Austin Beeson, hopefully I'm not butchering your name, Austin, said, while it certainly is true that Mormon leaks will filter through the documents given to them and highlight the leaks that fit their agenda, that doesn't change the need for there to be a channel open for individuals to report things that they see or hear that run contrary to their moral compass. It's too bad that people don't feel comfortable bringing up these issues with their leaders or these issues are falling on deaf ears. Mormon Leaks is probably more so pouring gasoline on the fire, but I think that they highlight a key problem. People are afraid of voicing open disagreement, even for good reasons at times. And there's more. Michael Wilcox said, I'm so tired of all news organizations stretching for a story when it isn't there. It goes for both sides. The Deseret News, LDS Living, and others do way too much puff and clickbait, uh, do, do way too much puff and clickbait stuff. On the other side, you have local Utah news like the Tribune and KUTV looking for a negative angle to expose the church in search of clicks. Both are shameful and a waste of everyone's time. And Craig Stapley wrote, I personally don't see change happening in a vacuum. The most well-intentioned, though left unspoken, doesn't count for much. I think the church adapts and changes just like any institution when there is an application of pressure. The leaks are but one voice. They are effective at drawing out the conversation and dialogue as evidence with this and this post and others. Adam Ellsworth said, I haven't noticed any change in the church's transparency as a result of Mormon leaks. Mormon leaks increases transparency a little bit against the church's will by showing things that were not previously public, but I have not found the leaks I have seen to read or read very enlightening. And then Donnie Pack wrote, if the church provided a safe and open means of inquiry, there wouldn't be a need for more controversial communication methods like Mormon leaks. A fear-based system doesn't allow dialogue. And Brian, we had a couple from Twitter. The first one, Rosenby at... Chunka Monkey says, they aren't helping the church to become more transparent, but I think they're helping young people to get a better idea of what is really happening. Additionally, Danny Berger at Danny Berger 12 writes, replying to the rant on Mormon leaks, negativity is contagious. That's what they're about. And they also, they make harsh claims and judgments without knowing or disclosing all the facts. They want the church to be transparent when they aren't. So Brian, wow, we've got a lot of hot takes on this. And I got to know, uh, where are you standing? Because it seems like we're all over the board here. Yeah. I mean, we, first of all, I just want to say to everybody who took the time to write in to make a comment uh, or to email us, we really appreciate it. Uh, I think that everybody's given some pretty articulate uh, words to what the, their ideas are behind this. Um, there was nothing in there that I thought was just uh, being bombastic for the sake of being bombastic. Um, you know, some things I agreed with more than others, but here's, here's the deal, Brant. As you mentioned earlier, you know, we have been talking with them and just trying to sort things out. Um, you know, and I kind of, uh, I went off on him last, uh, last, in last week's show, wouldn't you say? That's, yes, that, yeah. that's an understatement. Yeah. So what I'm, what I'm about to say is probably going to come as a surprise to some, and those who uh, have already been skeptical of my loyalty to the church institution, this will probably put, this will probably give you even more reason um, to, be, uh, to be skeptical of me, but I'm actually going to say something nice and hopefully rational about the uh, Mormon Leaks guys. Hold on. I don't even know if I'm ready for this yet, Brian. So, all right. All right. You, you, get, you, you go with your rationality and all that okay. stuff. Let's see what you got. So let's, so let's think about this for a second. We've had a couple of really important stories breaking over the past couple of years that have, that have done some, uh, some changing, some, uh, I don't know, awareness uh, and maybe even policy changing in some areas. And the two stories that I'm thinking of uh, right now is number one, the BYU story that the Salt Lake Tribune won the Pulitzer Prize for. Do you remember that story, Brant? Oh, yeah. Yep. That was the one that made huge, huge news. It, it, Brian, if I remember, it, it was a story about 
uh, those who were going to the honor code off, uh, I'm sorry, those who were going to their ecclesiastical leaders to confess uh, sexual sins or even sexual, not even sexual sins, but it was more instances of sexual assault where they felt- Sexual assault, that was the key. And that's a big difference. It's sexual assault to an ecclesiastical leader. And some of those leaders were in turn reporting that information to the honor code office. Yeah, so what you think would be clergy privilege was ended up uh, harming their ability to remain students in good standing at BYU, right? And so there was a bit of victim blaming going on here. Not a bit, a lot. And, uh, and because this story broke, and because Peggy Fletcher Stack and the Salt Lake Tribune did such a good job of investigative reporting on this, it not only changed the course of BYU and changed their policies for the better, but also affected other universities uh, particularly around the area. I know Utah State University changed its policies and other uh, universities have started looking into the issue. So there is, an, there is a time when I say, you know, that this news that broke and it was, uh, you know, through leaking documents, it was through people coming out of the woodworks, made a change for the positive. That, that's, that's, a fair, that's a fair point. The second story I'm going to bring up is the November 5th policy. Mm-hmm. Now, the November 5th policy has affected a lot of people, a lot of people that you and I both know, Brand. Uh, I've had uh, close family members that have dropped out of the church over it. I've seen people, you know, personally affected by this. It's been something that's been very hard uh, for me to watch. Now, when the November 5th policy was first unrolled, it wasn't, it wasn't unrolled with a public press release from the church uh, public relations department to media outlets or to its members. It was backdoored into the uh, church handbook of instructions for bishops. Am I right? Yep. And, and I believe that we all found out about it because someone took screenshots and put it on the ex-Mormon subreddit. Right. And okay. so then you have an organization uh, like Mormon Leaks who verified the accuracy of the, uh, of the information, found out that it was, and then the press started picking up on it. Right. So I'm not going to give Mormon Leaks all of the credit for breaking the news in that story, but they did participate in that. And that's a policy that affects a lot of people, a lot of members of the church. And so it's one of those things that you would think we should, we should know about. It should, it should have been something that was publicly announced to the church. And you know, the reason that it wasn't was because they knew that there was going to be a wild storm of backlash, which there was, but it looked worse when it was trying to, when it was backdoored in and then released through a leak. Am I right? You're right. You're right. And, and Brian, I, I'm, I think we're, we're two, sides of the, two sides of the same coin, but I think we might be almost equal distance apart. I'm, I'm with you, and, and I'm, I'm at a point where I, I really think that the more transparency, the better, mostly because that's just the way that we're going right now. In, in our entire world and culture, people are striving for authenticity. Are you telling me the, what I want to hear, or are you telling me what is actually going on? And so I think when you start including a little bit of the LDS church in that as well, There are some areas where we should be extremely transparent. And there are some areas where I think a modicum of privacy is there. Now, I will say this. I think sometimes the LDS Church as a very, very conservative religion and and, and a group of very conservative individuals, sometimes they fault on the way too conservative side. But I think that what Mormon Leaks does, while I don't particularly agree with a lot of their methodology, um, and I don't particularly agree with... um, some of the vetting processes and the selection processes that they go through, you can't deny that what is happening with them is in essence, they're kicking the LDS church into the, into the 2017. And, and sometimes it's kicking and streaming. Um, So so, go ahead. But I I don't know if I, I, I I wish it would be a little different. I I don't like the fact that we have to go down this road to be able to get some of this stuff out there. I think that's my, my big thing with all this is it's like, Mm, there's a part of me that says I wish that we didn't have to have a, a group like Mormon Leaks that was receiving this information from various individuals on various topics and whatever and releasing it in whatever methodology and way that they're releasing it. Uh, but at the same time, man, without them, ah, and, and, and Brian, I know from your perspective, um, we've discussed the historical significance of this. What do you do from a historian's perspective when you have things like this that are leaked out um, and, and some of it legitimately has some historical value. And if you're talking about doing a scholarly type book, referencing some of these things, it makes it tough. Uh, and, and I know that, I think you've mentioned that usually um, in situations like this, scholars will try and reference news articles versus the institutions. Is that right? Yeah, usually because it's something that other people can find. Yeah. 
Yeah. So let me get, let me, let me parse out what you just said there, because I think that's a, a, an important key here is the vetting process, the overall vetting process, because there's areas where, you know, I mean, I, I know that I'm giving Mormon leaks a bit of a hug right now and saying, Hey, look, you guys do a service. But on the other hand, I also think that uh, if I were them, I would probably be a lot more discriminating in the stuff that I put out. And, and what I'm, what I'm referring to, and they know this too, we, this is, this is what I told them. What, what, what I'm referring to is things that are uh, ecclesiastical abuse in nature, uh, certainly sexual assault, um, things that are uh, policies that are going to affect negatively a large percentage of the membership, um, things that, that can harm, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think, I think that that's where the focus and the energy needs to go. And, you know, Brant, I'm all for a free press, an open media, and freedom of speech, yep. right? I'm all for calling people out when they do stupid stuff particularly when it's institutional abuse, right? Yep. And now as an active Latter-day Saint, and as somebody who considers myself to be loyal to the institution, it pains me to think of my institution as having the possibility of doing harm to people, right? I, I genuinely want to believe that my institution, that the institution that I belong to does good overall for people. And I think it does. I think that by and large, the institution does good more than harm. Mm -hmm. However, I'm not naive enough to think that everything is always on the up and up, to think that there isn't any danger, to think there isn't any possible harm that can be done uh, to members or, you know, or, or otherwise. And so it's kind of one of those trust but verify things. Which right? is a bad thing. I, I really don't think it's a bad thing. So at any rate, so that's, that's where I'm sitting. If I was them, I would probably be a lot more discriminating with what I put out, looking for things that are specifically harmful. To, uh, to the general membership or to other, uh, to other groups. And, you know, it could be financial, it could be, uh, it could be sexual, it could be what, whatever it is. And the reason for that is because I think that otherwise, when you don't have a vetting process and when you just, when you put everything out there that you receive anonymously, I think that it becomes a boy who cries wolf to some extent, right? Now, here's the other side of this, because I know that that's, so we have a different philosophy than them. They, they say, no, we're not going to vet. That's, that's up to, you know, we're not going to discriminate against the information that's given to us. We're just making it available. And it's up to the press or whoever to go in and investigate it and research it and to create a story off of it. But you and I both know, Brant, that the media is looking for clicks, that they're looking, that they're going to spin. Yep. They're going to look for the hottest take on the story so that they can get the clicks to their, to their website. So that means that anything they put out that's fairly innocuous, and this is what I complained about last week, was this story about BYU and its, um, and its application acceptance process. Yep, that, that, now that's the right. one that was giving mails. They, they graded them on a point system and they gave mails one extra point. Right. The document that had that information. Yeah, during a time when they were trying to equalize the male to female uh, population. And then when you dig into this kind of stuff, you realize that universities oftentimes play with their alg algorithms like this to try to equalize their student populations. So it was one of those things that's like, it's, eh, it's really not that big of a deal, right? Like, you know, at least, at least it's something that BYU doesn't need to be singled out on. Yep. If that makes sense. So, and I think they would agree with that. They're like, yeah, it's not, I mean, you know, we put it out there. We didn't think it was going to get much traction. Uh, but we put it out there because that's what we do. And we'd been, you know, dragging our feet on putting that document out there because we didn't think it had a lot of meat behind it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, they did admit that there are times when they, when they do target something based on, you know, like when Trump came into town and they said, uh, you know, we're going to go ahead and put out the document about his, uh, his, his parents being, uh, you know, baptized in the temples, right? So they targeted that for when he came into town. And spoiler alert, that's a story that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Yeah. Um, but... I think that the, uh, you know, overall, the philosophy that they have of just putting everything out there, my concern with that is that it's feeding the beast of the media and the media is going to go in, they're going to grab whatever source. And I know, and I did ask them how, you know, I mean, there are some times when they submit to the press and yeah. say, hey, you know, like three or four or five press uh, people they'll, uh, that are on their list, they'll say, hey, you know, here's an interesting story you might want to run with. Other times the press is just following their website. Now, here's, here's what I would ask our listeners to do, to hold them accountable. They have a website, and I know you probably don't want to give it clicks, but if you really want to see the difference between how the media is spinning something, I think this is an interesting exercise, by the way. Yep. If you really want to see the difference between how the media is spinning a story versus how they put it out there as a press release, go to their website, mormonleaks.io, and on there you'll see their press room, 
And when you go to their press room, you'll see in order, chronological order from most recent to past, the documents that they've put out to the press or for press availability. And usually they'll have a title and there'll be some sort of a scant description beneath it and then the links to the documents themselves. The, the description itself, I, I, I skimmed through a couple of pages and I found that most of them were just descriptive in nature. Just these are the documents that we have with no commentary, nothing from the guys at Mormon Leaks. However, there were a few times when they put in further commentary in there because they knew that the media tended to, to twist this stuff out of, out of proportion. Yep. For example, the, the, the Trump story that we're going to get to. When you, if you go and visit how that was laid out on their website, you'll see that they put in quite a bit of information about Mormon practices of baptism for the dead, making it clear that this does not necessarily convert those people to Mormonism, that it gives them the opportunity to accept it. That's what we believe in the afterlife. They made that pretty clear in how they framed this to the media. Now, did Newsweek run it that way? Not right. from what we saw. Not, well, from, not from what we saw. So, okay, so, so here's the other thing, too. Um, there is a part of me that I, I get where you're going with that. You know, we're, we're always feeding the media machine and, and you're going to see a lot of that. And it's not just a Mormon issue. It's, it's, it's everywhere. But I think Mormonism includes this extra level of emotion because of everything within our culture and everything, including the, the consistent push and pull between believers and ex-believers or non-believers, however you want to describe them, right? And I don't know how that a, a group like them, because when, when you phrase it that way, and, and again, this is, I think we should be fully transparent, Brian, in the interest of transparency. This is a conversation that we've been having with them nonstop over the past week. It's actually been a really exciting uh, and interesting conversation, despite the fact that, uh, you know, I, I leave for some meetings and then I come back and I've got 200 messages between all three of you guys. Um, I don't know how you resolve some of those issues, though, simply for the fact of there's transparency and then there's transparency with an agenda. And it doesn't matter where you're coming from on, that, on any spectrum. People are always going to view you with an agenda somehow, some way. And I think the only way that a group like that could resolve some of those um, lingering concerns or questions, because you're never going to make everyone better, is potentially if you were to get some believers involved with that, to be able to offset it a little bit, to be able to have some more, um, how would I phrase it, neutral language, to be able to have an objective outside look. Now, there's going to be problems with that. Problem number one, are any believers going to want to be involved in a, in a situation or an institution like that? And I'm talking your traditional believers. Um, and then problem number two is going to be, okay, so whose agenda are we going to run with? Um, so, why, why are we going to release this? You know so what I mean? are you saying, you're saying that they need an editor? Uh, I think so. <laughs> I might know an editor. Hey, listen, listen. <laughs> I know you've got all this free time, right? At <laughs> any rate. Well, I want to move on from this, but I just wanted to, to just kind of clear up my, my blow up from last week. I have to admit that I came from a position of ignorance on how things work with them, how they put things up, how they feed things to the media. And, and I'm going to be honest, I'm going to fall on my sword and say, I've never, I never actually visited their website. And the reason for that was because I never wanted to give them the clicks because I had a negative uh, view of them. So I didn't want to get in there uh, and look at the bad guys. Right. Yep. But I'm glad that I did because now I can see exactly how they, how they put things up. Now, you know, again, as we've, as we've talked to them, so this won't come as a surprise, my biggest recommendations are be more discriminating in the stories than they are because it becomes a boy who cried wolf situation where eventually people just, you know, stop paying attention to you altogether. I don't think that it's helping the church become any more transparent by putting everything out there. Um, stick to the stories that really matter, in my opinion. Number two, make sure that you're framing things in a way that at least when the media goes out and does its thing and spins it for clicks, at least you're in the clear because at least you gave it a solid attempt of saying, look, I put it out as fairly as possible and they took it and ran with it in another direction. But at least we could compare that side by side. I mean, right. if, if anything, you, you did your due diligence and then you could, in essence, you could uh, claim, uh, I don't want to say claim ignorance, but you, you can claim innocence and say, look, this is, this is what we wrote. This is what the media did. I don't have any control over how headlines are written or, or however they're going to want to spin this or, or however, this is, this is what we got. So. Yeah. so we've got a lot to get to today and we're going to have to move on from this, but I hope that that kind of helps our audience. Uh, kind of understand our position on this and some of the some of the looking into it that we've done this week. Now, before we move into getting into the news, we got an interesting letter uh, that I want to uh, read um, from Lois Lawrence, and it's not a nice letter, but I wanted to take the opportunity to thank Lois for writing us because, you know, whether it's critical, whether it's whether you guys think that we're awesome, I mean, hey, we're not for everybody, 
right? We're not, and we're not above criticism and critique. And I, I'm used to, <laughs> I'm, I'm used to nasty Graham. So it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, but, no, 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 Lois is a Patreon subscriber. And so we want to make sure that we give Lois, um, you know, a, a few minutes to, to make sure that her voice is heard. Right. right. Absolutely. And we appreciate your, your support on Patreon. I don't know if she's going to continue supporting us after I respond to her letter, but hopefully in the interest of uh, open dialogue, uh, she'll see where we're coming from on this. Uh, she said, not nice disparaging President Trump on your show. Are you even aware that he's taking no salary for his job? So you stating that he would be getting into the coin return to steal change is asinine. Okay, Lois, I'm going to stop there and just quickly respond to that and just say, it was a poor taste joke. It's all it was. It was a joke. You know, I, I, I don't have a lot of high humor. I mean, it was funny. That's, and I'm sorry that, uh, that you took that seriously. We're not saying that he's uh, going to go out there and, and steal coins. It was just something that, it wasn't scripted, right? It was just something that came to Brant's mind right then. He was laughing about it. I asked him what he was laughing about, and he said it. So, yeah, I'm, we're sorry. Okay, uh, she said, uh, are you aware that Utah's electoral vote was far more for Trump than for Hillary and helped him get elected? And, and yes, yes, I'm very aware of that, Lois, and it, and it bothers me. It, it crushes my heart to know that Utah was one of the outliers for Trump during the primaries and that even the church-owned newspaper, Deseret News, asked Trump to resign uh, from the presidential campaign. Um, we made it clear from the church's standpoint that they didn't like the things that he was saying on immigration in particular. So Mormons weren't really that comfortable with Trump up until the election when they went into the voting polls and decided that they hated Hillary more. Once that curtain was closed behind them... Yeah. And, and, then, and but you know what, though, Brian, that's something that happened across the country. I mean, that it did. Every, every poll was saying that it was going to be neck and neck or Hillary was a little bit ahead. And then the curtains closed. And, and that's what happened. It, yeah, exactly. And, and so what bothers me in this whole thing is that the reason that Trump took Utah is because Utah really hated Hillary, not because they loved Trump. I mean, I think that's just a fact. So I think that we caved and I think that uh, that's actually mud in our face. I'm going to I'm going to say that. I mean, it's and she, and OK. So continue with her letter. He is our president, whether you like it or not. He is the POTUS and, and have a little respect. Yes, I recognize that he's the president of the United States of America. I'm not one of those who says not my president. He is my president. He is the president of our, of our country and our nation. No, I don't like the guy. I think uh, in my opinion, he's uh, in my lifetime, which I've, I've been born since, uh, oh, the Carter administration. That's how far back. I, I, I thought you were going to say the Civil War, Brian. Yeah, the Civil War. Right? Sometimes I feel that way. But no, I was born in the Carter. Uh, no, Ford. I was, Ford in the, I was born uh, the year Gerald Ford uh, became how, president. How far back do we want to go, Brian? <laughs> right, right. Actually, Nixon. No, it was Nixon. <laughs> yeah, it was actually Nixon. No. But, so I'm, I'm still fairly young. But in my lifetime, he's, he's the worst president I've seen. And, and he's, uh, he's an embarrassment to the White House, in my opinion. Right. I, I, wish, I wish that we had a president with a higher moral standard. Um, have a little respect. I respect the office of the president. I'm not going to respect him as an individual in, in the presidency. And I'm sorry about that. That's just, that's, that's just the way that it is. I would hate to see the world if Hillary had won. I don't think we need to play that game, Lois, of it's still playing on the, he's, well, at least he's better than Hillary. Well, Hillary's way out of the picture. Now we're dealing with Trump in office, doing what he's doing. And I'm not, I'm not happy with what he's doing. Uh, then you continued and said, I would have much, I would much better have seen Romney win, uh, you know, but he didn't. Now Romney obviously didn't even run, so there was no possibility of him winning, but I get your point. And I think that I'm on the same page. I would have rather Romney as well. Keep your eyes out for 2020 or 2024. Like yeah, that, we'll, that's we'll see what happens. the hill that I'm going to stake my flag in. Just keep your eyes out. And incidentally, Romney isn't the biggest uh, cheerleader behind Trump either, if you haven't, uh, if you haven't noticed. He's, he's, he's setting himself up. Uh, in opposition to Donald Trump. So we'll get I, don't to that think it's, too. I don't think it's crazy. <laughs> okay, so here we are for the, so then she switches topics and says, I also think that your show borders on being anti-Mormon. Having the Mormon leaks people on and you're groveling with them about the, about the term gaslighting was sickening. The founder of Mormon Leaks went to the temple and videotaped the ceremonies. Why didn't you ask him about that? He had a temple recommend and lied to get in. What a jerk. Okay, that's the end of her letter. Um, first of all, you're absolutely wrong. Uh, that was not Mormon leaks that went into the temple and uh, taped the ceremonies. That's a completely different person, completely different individual, not related at all to Ryan McKnight or Ethan Dutch. 
And I don't think we want to mention the individual who went into the temple and has released all the temple recording videos. No. And we have, and Brant and I have zero respect for that guy. And we'll tell him that to his face. We would never invite him on the show. Uh, what he does is absolutely deplorable. And it's an offense to my beliefs, to, to, the, uh, to the religion that I hold dear to. Um, I don't, I, we're really trying not to be anti-Mormon. But if you listen to the show from last week, the reason that the Mormon Leaks people were on Lois was because we had called them out by name. Brant had called them out by name the week prior to that about their op-ed piece in the Salt Lake Tribune. We didn't invite them on because we were interested in discussing Mormon leaks. We invited them on because we wanted to give them a chance to respond to us going off on them about the op-ed piece that they wrote to Salt Lake Tribune regarding gaslighting. Quite frankly, it just so happened to be that they were the Mormon leaks guys. It could have been anybody that had published that op-ed piece in the Salt Lake Tribune. And if we'd have called them out by name, we would have invited them to come on to respond to us because we're trying to be adults about this. It just so happened to be that they were the Mormon leaks guys. So salty, that's, Brian that's is salty today. Whoa. <laughs> anyway, I, you know, Lois, I, I, I get where you're coming from. I want you to continue giving us a chance if you will. If you won't, you won't. But, uh, you know, like I said, we're not for everybody. Uh, but we really do try to be fair and balanced and look at both sides of things and to give things, uh, an give people and, and ideas an opportunity to speak for themselves. And speaking of opportunities. Hold on. Fair and balanced. I think I've heard that before. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. You're not comparing us to Fox News now, are you? <laughs> I, I don't. You, Listen, speaking of opportunities, Brant, tomorrow is the last day of Greg Coford Books' annual 12 Days of Coford Sale, where they offer great deals on Mormon scholarship. You've got today and you've got tomorrow left. Now, tomorrow, get this. It's going to be an ebook flash sale on Kindle. Okay, oh. so you're going to have to go to, and this, this will be only for Kindle exclusively. They're going to put out 12 titles for a $1.99 for most of them. There's a couple of them that are a little higher, but most of them are a $1.99. And I'll give you a teaser on two that I think that everybody should download. Brian and Laura Hale's Joseph Smith Polygamy, Toward a Better Understanding, and Nyland McBain's Women at Church. You're familiar with that book. Both, both of those are a buck ninety nine each? They're both a dollar ninety nine each for one day only. Um, are you guys trying to go bankrupt? Because everyone's going to be buying those. Like, I can't believe you guys are offering those books for that cheap. Those books are like at least twice, worth twice as much. Well, yeah, twice, three times, four times. But... We're doing it because this is the, we tip it, we've done this traditionally on December 12th, on the last day of our 12 days of Christmas, kind of giving this big final push to it and giving people a really, really good deal to get their hands on the content. It's not making us any money, but it's giving, the, giving people an opportunity to get some books that they've wanted to have for a long time. So here's what you need to do tomorrow morning on December 12th. Greg Gopher Books is going to post on their Facebook and Twitter pages a link to the 12 books that they're offering the sale on. Again, it's good for one day only. So follow them at facebook.com slash gkbooks or on twitter.com slash gkbooks. Let's get on with the news. Okay, Brian, let's get into it. Uh, this one is first from the Salt Lake Tribune. Pressure builds for BYU to scrap its beard band. But I'm not going to complain about this one, Brent. I, I figured you wouldn't. But if it does, don't expect the Mormon school to become a haven for the unshaven. Hey, oh, someone <laughs> headliner uh, gets their uh, bonus this week. Um, so here's an interesting one. This has been a, a discussion that we seem to have every three to five years. Oh, hey, let's go back to the beard band. Um, let me give you a little bit of background. In 1971, Down H. Oaks, then BYU's president, and now a senior Mormon apostle told students that Rules against beard and long hair are contemporary and pragmatic. They are responsive to conditions and attitudes in our own society at this particular point in time and are subject to change. This was back in 1971. I would be surprised if they were not changed at some time in the future. Okay, so that was 1971. Now it's 2017. Uh, there are three categories for beard exemptions because the BYU, the, the, the school still has the beard ban in place. The three exemptions are medical, theatrical, or religious. So for example, if you are part of a non-LDS religion that requires you to have a beard, you can have that one. Uh, if you're in a, a play or um, some sort of a, a film that's being filmed, you can get an exemption there or medical. And I know quite a few people who've had the medical beard card exemption. So the attitudes are changing. And Brian, here's something that I've seen, at least personally in my corporate environment. My corporate environment is fairly conservative. Um, I'm seeing more and more people with beards and they're mostly young people. And so I think what you're going to see is probably in the next 20 years, this will get overturned. There's no doubt in my mind, mostly because the beards now aren't 
they're not as gross as people think they are. And, and I think the more and more you're seeing younger people, at least in positions of power in conservative corporate environments, have beers, the more that we're seeing them, for example, uh, on television, the more people are going to be comfortable with that. And I think it's inevitably going to change with BYU unless BYU and, and the LDS church and, and everyone in between goes back to the easy fallback of tradition because that's all we seem to know is, oh, it's always been traditional that we've never had this except, wait, this tradition started in 1971. And, right. Wait, and no. I don't know, Brian. It's it's one of those where it's like, okay, it's it's every three to five years. It's time to have this story again. But it's like, okay, all right. Well, we'll we'll see what happens. I think we're I think we're edging closer there. You know, they, they, so I was talking to somebody down at BYU, and they said that they had these uh, they had these things set up to kind of take a, take the pulse on students as to what they felt about the the beard pan uh, the beard band. One of them was I think it was like a big uh, I don't want to say it was like styrofoam or some big um, head basically, yeah. right? And then the other one was a box. And then they had, uh, they had all these like uh, cotton balls, right? And so the students could take the cotton ball and they could decide whether to throw it in the empty box saying, no, I don't want beards. Mm-hmm. Or they could pin it on the, somewhere on the big giant head. So right. like they're put, uh, the cotton balls are going to be pieces of beer that they're putting on it, right? Right, right, exactly. So, so about a week later, they went back and visited this box and the entire head was just covered with cotton balls. And inside the, uh, the box, there was maybe like two. Yeah. Cotton balls. So, I mean, you know, that's a scientific survey if I've ever heard of one. I'm, Brian, that's about as scientific as the survey that I did uh, using a Google form. So, <laughs> hey. so I think it's, you know, I, I, I think that the times they are a change and let's just say that. Uh, so let's just, let's move on here. Speaking of times that they are a change and let's talk about the, uh, the next Mormon survey stuff. And so speaking of surveys, so this is a survey that's been done by Benjamin Knoll and Jana Reese. And what they've been doing is they've been trying to find out what's going to be happening with Mormons in the future. So looking at people probably younger than even my demographic, Brian. Um, so they asked, they've been releasing little bits and nuggets here and there along the way. And I think that they're not going to get fully released until like 2018, maybe even 2019. Either way, so they asked each self-identified Mormon respondent to answer the following question. Which statement comes closest to your own views, even if none is exactly right? Okay, so this is a question about their belief in the LDS church. 49.1% said that I believe wholeheartedly in all the teachings of the LDS church. 33.9% said I believe many or most of the teachings of the LDS church. 12.2% said some of the teachings of the LDS church are hard for me to believe. 3.1% said many or most of the teachings of the LDS church are hard for me to believe. And 1.8% said, I do not believe in the teachings of the LDS church. So some interesting information, Brian, probably something that I don't think people are too surprised at. Um, I think some of the language that they're using is, is relatively interesting. It's, 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 it's something that I think people can discuss. Uh, what, is, what does that mean? What does that mean if you're responding to it in that way? But here's a couple of other nuggets that came out. Among Mormons who said they attend church at least once a week, which was 74% of all Mormons in the survey, 9% of that 74 expressed some degree of doubt. Among those who say they are very active, 55% of all Mormons, 6% expressed a degree of doubt. Even among those who are current temple recommend holders, 4% express at least a degree of doubt in LDS church teachings. So Brian, doubt is really trendy right now. I I actually just had a conversation with someone in my home ward about the whole concept of doubt and how I don't know if doubt's the best language that we should be using to describe some of that. But it's, it's, it's a survey result where I'm sitting here saying that's not too different from what I thought. If I'm just doing some quick math on the, on the back of the scratch pad here, it looks like about 84% said they either believe in all or most of the teachings of the LDS church. That's not too surprising. Um, but I also think that it's, you're starting to see that uh, believe in many or most of the teachings of the LDS church. That cohort is seeming to grow, especially among younger Mormons. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that uh, the survey results, if they if they're surprising at all, I think it should be surprising to those who assume that there's this massive disaffection going on within the LDS Church right now, uh, and we see that when we see uh, groups online, they tend to because their group numbers tend to grow to you know a thousand or two thousand or three thousand people in their group, they tend to assume that they're representative yeah. of what's happening within the LDS Church, and I think that this kind of shows that uh, by and large, most Mormons still believe. Right. Yeah, and and I think that was kind of the kind of the joke that they used was that line from the Book of Mormon mu- musical. Uh, a Mormon just believes they're they're <laughs> kind of there. Um, but I do think that what is interesting, and and I w- I will say this from the outset, 
Um, I know that Jana and Benjamin have actually come under a lot of fire because of people that aren't, they're seeing the results of the survey going, well, I'd want to know who they're talking to. And I know from talking to Jana specifically, they made a very conscientious and deliberate effort to make sure that the individuals that they were, uh, how do I just, uh, I'm, I'm losing the language to describe surveys, but the, their survey group, uh, what am I trying to say, Brian? The, the people that they surveyed, they tried to make sure it was a representative sample. So not, not a self-selected sample of, for example, disaffected Mormons or uh, not completely and totally ultra progressive Mormons, but a, a large smattering of people. And so it's interesting to see that. But I also wonder, Brian, if this is something that is not unique to the LDS faith and if this is something that we're seeing more and more with people in, in general. They're much more comfortable with a degree of vaguety or, or a degree of not uh, absolutism in, in any of their beliefs, whether it's, it's religion, whether it's politics, whether it's social issues. Um, there are some always going to be the hard, hardliners on there. Um, but I, I don't know. I, 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 I work a lot with the youth and I see them being a lot more comfortable with, well, maybe, maybe this, maybe that. I don't know. I'm just trying to figure it all out. Sorry, I had myself on mute. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> well, welcome to welcome. Live Radio, Brian. Welcome, welcome to seeing how the sausage is made behind the scenes here, folks. I'm sitting here talking away, and my mic is on mute. But you know, we've since since we do have quite a bit more to get to. I really didn't have anything more interesting to add to that one, other than other than just acknowledging the fact that it's really not that big of a surprise. Now, I do think it's interesting though that uh, there are there there is some growth in the people who say, well, you know, there are some things that I that I just really have a hard time. Uh, believing, but I believe most of what the church teaches. That group seems to be growing. Um, and, and but Brian, before, yeah. before we move on, I will say this though: I would think that once the survey results are officially out, and so not that we're seeing all these little snippets from uh, Benjamin and Janet, but once this is out, I would say that anybody, whether you are a parent of younger uh, children who are Mormon, or if you work with younger Mormons, whether in the youth or with the young single adults, this is a survey that you should read and you should be thinking about and trying to figure out: Does this apply to my group? Because I think there's going to be a lot of good information there. Just understanding who are the Mormons that are going to be running and leading the church in the next 50 to 100 years. Right. So why don't we get into uh, Trump's visit? This oh, boy. So the Donald came to Utah. Oh, Brian, this was a joyous and wonderful week. Um, so <laughs> what did I say? Wait, what did I say last week when he came? I said I was just hoping for the right photo op. We're going to get to that in a second. That's a spoiler. Oh, it's boy. a teaser. Is that a, is that a great photo? So, okay, so the, the, the president made a few statements at LDS Welfare Square. It was very brief. Um, and what he said was, I would love to, while the media is here, just to say a couple of words of what we just discussed. All the care and all the giving that you've done and to help people, in particular poor people, would be a good thing. Perhaps they will transmit that to different parts of this country and the world. It's so brilliant to hear. So President Irene was there, and he said, thank you, Mr. President. We're here in a place where we have food and materials that we give to the poor. This is simply an example of what we do across the world. The idea being that we think we have an obligation to God to look out for the people who, without our aid, have tragedy in their lives, be it poverty or hunger. I mean, it, Brian, it was, I was amazed at how many news outlets picked up on President Trump going to Welfare Square, going inside the welfare store, being with uh, President Eyring and, and President Nelson and uh, Bishop Kose, and I think there was one more there. Oh, um, I'm sorry. President Bingham, Sister Bingham from the, uh, from the Relief Society. Um, it was really interesting to see, like, those pictures were plastered everywhere. Okay, are we, are we ready for the photo? Okay. Let's this do is the photo. photo. This is the photo. No, I did, I, did the, I did the funny one. So here we go. Okay. <laughs> can you see that photo? I, I can see it. So if you're, if you're watching us on video, there is a great picture of both President Trump and uh, President Nelson there. They don't have the best looks on their faces. They look... Um, well, they don't look, uh, they don't look too happy, uh, but it is a picture of the two of them standing next to each other and someone has photoshopped a huge t-shirt that says, our get along shirt. <laughs> uh, so those who are listening to us on audio, I'm sorry that you don't, don't get to see the picture, but uh, you know, we, we will have this up on, on our Patreon page as well as YouTube and Facebook. So if you want to go in and you know, even fast forward to where we're at now just to see the photo. You welcome, welcome to do that. But uh, so I had asked, uh, you know, a couple of, um, I don't know, some feedback on, uh, on, on the, the photo and it, is, it was the one without the t-shirt on them. Uh, and we got a, we got a little bit of, uh, of, of funny remarks on that. So do you want to just uh, highlight a couple of those? Sure. So one of them, uh, again, this is a picture of both uh, President Trump and President Nelson. They're standing there. They don't, 
it's probably just a, an unfortunate photo time to take it, but they don't have the best looks on their face. Uh, and so one of the, one of the comments was uh, president Nelson saying, are you done yet? And no, you're not getting a candy bar on this trip. <laughs> Another one was uh, president Trump saying, so wait, why can't these people just go get a job from the job store? President Nelson, uh, we talked about this, Mr. President. That isn't a thing. President Trump, well, they should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. President Nelson, Mr. President, these people are doing as much as they possibly can, and we feel a Christian imperative to help them. President Trump, well, I just don't get it. I'm a self-made man. I didn't need this. President Nelson, President Irene, don't you have something else you want to show the president? Uh, the next one, sir, I think you have more than 12 items in your cart. <laughs> I mean, he does. I mean, if we're all, listen, we Mormons, if anything, we're all about rules. So 12 items is 12 items. Uh, another one, Donald, you know, we can't afford the fun pack. What do you think money grows on trees in this family? Take it back. Oh, that was a good one. I think that was, that. was that you? That was me. Yeah, oh, that was good. That was good. Okay. Next one. Is it really necessary to make funeral potatoes? <laughs> is all this really necessary? Oh, is all, yeah, is all, oh, you're right. I butchered that one. Let me do it again. Is all of this, all these ingredients in the cart, really necessary to make funeral potatoes? All right. And Brian, we know the answer. Yes, of course. The answer is of course, right? Uh, okay, and, and then the last one, how much is a bag of pasta? Like $45? <laughs> that's an Arrested Development uh, reference for all of you. Oh, Anyways, check it, check out the picture. It's good. Um, I, I, Brian, it, Brian was just giddy this week because we got that picture. I was, I was. I was really hoping for the you know, obviously not happy to be there. And, you know, Brant, it wouldn't surprise me if they had to draw straws to, you know, who was going to meet with, uh, with President Trump uh, from the quorum. They're humans. And I have a feeling that a few of them probably don't like Trump either. So probably not. So <laughs> anyway, so speaking of Donald Trump this week, Brian, oh boy, we referenced this in the, uh, in the beginning, but there was some more news this week about Donald Trump and the Mormons. This is from Newsweek. Mormons baptized Donald Trump's parents and grandparents after they died, Mormon leaks revealed. Members of the Mormon Church posthumously baptized President Donald Trump's parents and grandparents, according to leaked documents from the whistleblowing organization Mormon Leaks, which aims to expose corruption in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. According to the documents on the Mormon Leaks website, the Mormon Church baptized Trump's grandfather, Friedrich, who died in 1918, and his grandmother, Elizabeth Mary Christ, who died in 1966, in 2015 and 2016. Trump's parents, Marianne McLeod and Frederick Christ Trump, were also baptized, but the ordinances were not made available to the public. According to McKnight, it's likely the church's top leadership is unaware that Trump's relatives have been baptized. Quote, the names that are submitted are done at a very low level in the church. That is very unlikely that the institution had any knowledge or say in the process, McKnight said. And I don't think that Ryan's wrong. I think that that's true. A lot of these, Brian, you, you know, because we've, we've, I don't know if you and I have covered this in the past, but this has been a story within Mormonism for the past 20 or 30 years, going all the way back to Holocaust victims back in the uh, mid-90s, uh, being baptized in the LDS church posthumously through baptisms for the dead. Um, but I don't know if it's a Mormon-wide conspiracy the way that Newsweek was making it out to be. And I think this is what you were referencing when it came to a lot of the different media outlets taking the story and running with it. Right. I, I think that this is a great example of looking how, at how Newsweek framed this versus how it was pitched from uh, Mormon leaks on their uh, on on their press release and you'll see a pretty wide disparity now there were other news organizations this got covered by a lot of news, news organizations there were others that were more fair in their coverage I think KSL did a pretty decent job of covering this and sticking fairly closely to the to the type of framing that was offered to them um, you know I, I think that really what it comes down to here is that this is this is one of those things where it's like is it really any surprise right I mean it, that that some member of the church who was a supporter of Trump's would think that they're doing the Trump family a favor by baptizing them. But it does reveal, I think, that we still have this issue in the church where we're baptizing people uh, without necessarily obtaining permission and maybe not being personally related to them. And that brings us back to what you said about the Holocaust survivors and Holocaust victims, rather, the Holocaust victims that were being baptized by the church. And, uh, and, and we, you know, rightly got mud on our faces uh, over, over that practice. But the problem is, is that it hasn't really stopped, right? So, there, there aren't enough checks and balances in place to make it really stop. So I think that what, what Mormon Leak saw in this, and again, I'm not trying to be too defensive over them, but what Mormon Leak saw in this was an opportunity to say, look, there are still these baptisms happening that probably shouldn't be happening. And, uh, and, and you know, maybe we need to open up the church's baptism records for, uh, for inspection by non-members of the church. Um, I don't know. 
What do you think? Or, or even put a more stringent process in place for uh, people who are going to be submitting names. Um, because if I, if, I were, if I were to find a shred of, of, uh, a shred of how I could defend this, um, granted, this is part of the information that we don't know, and I'm not trying to claim anyone's right or wrong in this situation. But for example, could it be a relative of Trump that's connected through a fourth cousin twice removed who just happened to be doing their genealogy and did that? Personally, I don't think that happened. Um, I think that's a big problem that we've had in the church and that we've seen happen time and time again, which is Mormons that are going out and trying to, I don't know how to describe it, like celebrity baptize, uh, do celebrity uh, posthumous baptisms for people. And I think it's wrong. And I, I, But the problem is, unless you put a much more stringent process in place as far as vetting and, and validating some of this stuff, I don't know if it's ever going to be fixed. I do think, though, yeah, we should be aware of it. And, and I, I don't think that the LDS church would be too happy, if, especially if you could find out names of who actually did this, to, to go to them and say, why are you doing this? Like, stop. They're not, it's, it's not your role to do this. You, you don't have any relation to them. So therefore, you should not be doing this. Whether it's going to happen or not, I don't know. I, I think that the only way that it's going to happen, um, I don't know. They, I mean, they, they got a lot of mud on their face with the, uh, with the Holocaust victims back in the mid-90s. You figured that would have done things, and I know that they issued letters and things like that. Mm, but we saw it again with uh, President Obama. Now we're seeing it with President Trump. I'm sure you could go back to everybody. I, I know that Adolf Hitler, uh, this has happened in the past with him. So it's like, okay, where do we, where do we go with it? I don't know. Right. So we have a lot of political news to cover this week. So we're gonna we're just gonna kind of plow right through this. Oh boy! All right. So okay. First off, let let's let's just get this out of the way. Um, Mitt Romney's in the news a lot, and Steve Bannon's in the news a lot. So everyone, buckle up. It's actually been a while since we've talked about our old friend Mitt Mittens Romney, and I've I've missed him, Brian. I don't know about you. It's like, hey, I, I forget having you in the news. Like every time I wake up in the morning. I, you know, I always I always enjoy seeing seeing him in the news, if nothing else, because. He still has that haircut. He's still got that square jaw. He's got the perfect teeth. And, you know, it's always just nice to see him smile and yeah, maybe throw a few jabs at uh, the Trump administration. There you go. Okay, so this is coming from Fairhope Atlanta. Or I'm sorry, Fairhope, Alabama. Former White House political strategist Stephen K. Bannon. And this is, again, coming from the Washington Post. Railed, uh, rallied for S S Republican Senate nominee Roy Moore by picking another fight with a figure from the so-called Republican establishment, 2012 GOP presidential nominee Mitt Romney. Judge Roy Moore has, made, has more honor and integrity in that pinky finger than your entire family has in his whole DNA, Bannon said in his 30-minute speech at Oak Hollow Farm. By the way, Mitt, while we're on the subject of honor and integrity, you avoided service, brother. Mitt, here's how it is, brother. The college deferments, we can debate that, but you hid behind your religion. You went to France to be a missionary while guys were dying in rice paddies in Vietnam. Do not talk to me about honor and integrity, he said, referencing Romney's warm faith. So, Brian, first of all, before we get into some of the other stuff going on here, um, I'm always questioning someone who overuses the phrase brother, okay? So that should be a big red flag there. If you've got someone that's like, hey, brother, let me tell you how it's going to be, brother. Okay, I, um, you know, my, my spidey sense is tingling just a little bit. Um, but our old pal Russell Stevenson actually made a really good point that I don't even think Bannon considered when he was getting into some of this stuff regarding uh, uh, draft deferments and military service deferments and missionaries. So he said, quick PSA in the dust up over Bannon's remarks regarding Romney's military service. Seriously, this kind of conversation is so old, almost as old as the Republic. A little mythology is taking hold. The draft was in place during Romney's missionary service, but it had a different form than 1969. Until 1969, the draft was run by draft boards who selected individual names collected through the Selective Service Administration. To redress the highly politicized and sometimes corrupt nature of the draft boards, the Romney, uh, the lottery system was implemented in 1969, making the selection process more randomized and less susceptible to political influence. So there's a lot of things that are going on here. Uh, here here's another comment uh, from Mel Tungate. Uh, Mel Tungate. Bannon is wrong, by the way. Mitt and I are the same age, four months apart, and we both went on our Mormon missions about the same time. 1965, war, not much. Uh, 23,000 U.S. men in Vietnam. Mitt had a student deferment and was attending Stanford. 1966, the war starts heating up. Now you have 190,000 in Vietnam at the beginning of the year when Mitt applies for his mission. If he hadn't gone on a mission, he would have went back to Stanford and gotten another deferment. Mitt gets a student deferment, then minister exemption mid-year, 1968. Mitt returns at the end of the year, goes back to school, at, but at BYU. He would have had a student deferment by the end of the year, almost 550,000 in Vietnam. In 1969, there was a student deferment. And then December 1st, 1969, the draft lottery, 
Mitt's number was 300. The highest number called up that year was not 195. The war was slowing down, but not yet over. And then in early 1973, the draft was ended. So this is kind of a crazy situation, Brian. And it's something that was actually surprising because a lot of people got really defensive about Mitt Romney and, and frankly, rightfully so, because I think I'm, I'm looking at Bannon's comments going, buddy, you are someone who I don't think you understand how that whole draft process worked. Look, I'm really young, and I had to go through a lot of their commentary, a lot of both Russell and Mel's commentary to figure out what exactly was happening. Uh, I'm try- actually trying to m- work my way through the, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, the guy who did the Civil War, um, Ken Burns, the Ken Burns documentary on Vietnam. Um, that's actually helping to put some context behind it, but it just felt so cheap. So here's another story, because Brian, you said we're going to blast through this, right? Yeah, let's, let's just keep moving. This is from the Salt Lake Tribune. Hatch, Herbert, and other Mormon observers blast Bannon's attack on Romney's LDS faith as disappointing and unjustified. Okay, so now Orrin Hatch has an inserted himself between the uh, Bannon, Romney, and Roy Moore because Bannon was at a Roy Moore uh, rally and Romney had been critical of Roy Moore considering some of the stuff that's gone on with Roy Moore's uh, sexual past. Uh, On Monday, the Washington Examiner reported that Hatch said he didn't think President Trump had any other option than to endorse the GOP Alabama Senate candidate who had been accused by multiple women of sexual misconduct. I don't think he had any choice but to do that. That's the only Republican we can get down there, Hatch said, according to the press pool report. He also noted many things he allegedly did were decades ago. So that's Warren Hatch's opinion on Roy Moore. Well, we got to have him because that's the only Republican we can get down there. And yet this week, Hatch went after Bannon after Bannon blasted mittens at a Roy Moore rally. Brian, are you keeping up with all this? Because like- this I'm is- trying. I'm trying. I've got charts. I've got graphs. I'm connecting red lines. Through, I was just uh, going to say, we're getting to that point where it's like, we're starting to get conspiracy theory. So here's what Hatch said. Steve Bannon's attacks on Governor, Mitt, on Governor Romney and his service are disappointing and unjustified. Mitt is a close personal friend, an honest leader, a great American, and someone who has sought every opportunity possible to serve our country. I also resent anyone attacking any person's religious views but particularly our own Christian LDS faith and the selfless service of missionary work, Hatch continued. I'd be more than happy to sit down with Mr. Bannon and help him understand more about the LDS church at his convenience. I've got a copy of the Book of Mormon with his name on it. Ooh. <laughs> so he really, he does a missionary invite. You know, and maybe, maybe that's, uh, that's, that's the, way, the way to take this. Maybe Bannon needs to learn a little bit more about the Mormon faith and religion. Maybe we ought to sign him up for a missionary delivery of the Book of Mormon over to his house. And, you know, maybe he can compare that against some other religions. We can also sign him up for the Jehovah's Witnesses to bring uh, by their material. He'll have them until, uh, until the millennium. You know what, Brian? You know what I was thinking? You know what would be great? If all of our listeners decide to send a Book of Mormon over to Mr. Bannon's house, and the missionaries, could you imagine how much different he would feel about the LDS people if he were inundated with books of Mormon with his name on it? It would show him so much love. Right. And a couple of fresh-faced missionaries were like, Mr. Bannon, we just like to share you our message. How could you not love that? <laughs> anyway. So speaking of, so, okay, so we had that whole little, you know, I don't even call it, I don't know if I call it a love triangle. It was more like a love square. We're going to do a, like a love octagon now, Right. Okay, so let's keep talking about Orrin Hatch. This is from the Washington Post. If Senator Orrin Hatch won't retire, Mitt Romney should shove him aside. Okay. You know, but hold on, but it wouldn't take much of a shove. I mean, the guy's what, like 85 years old now? I mean, not, not that we're advocating for any physical, um, any physical interaction with anybody who's an octogenarian, but okay, there, here's what Rick Wilson at the Washington Post said. Love him or hate him, I'm admittedly in the first camp. Mitt Romney is a gentleman. That's why he's waiting patiently for Senate Republican, uh, for senior Republican Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah in office more than 40 years to decide on retirement before jumping into the 2018 Utah Senate race. It's admirable. It's also time for Romney to shove Hatch aside. Wait a minute, I thought we just talked about that. We don't shove 80 year olds. And Utah is a perfect fit for him. He's been out of the spotlight. But he's, a well known, he's as well-known as any Republican politician. Like Hatch, he'd be a Mormon running in a strongly Mormon state, unlike Hatch, who has become just another reliable Republican vote. Romney's evident distaste for the current administration is something in, sor- in sorely short supply among Republicans in Congress. I don't think Rick wrote this for people reading it like me. I've spent limited time in Utah in my career, but when I've been there, I've been struck every day by Utah's decency, work ethic, common sense, and in particular, compassion for others. The state's unique demographics, culture, and politics makes it a fascinating laboratory for conservatism, and Utah is conservatism without the constant sense of grievance that marks the Trump-era GOP, plus 
fry sauce is a national treasure. I mean, Brian, if this guy is, is looking for the Utah vote, he's got it right there. Did, did, did he write that in there? Plus fry sauce is a national treasure. Did you totally, add? No, he totally wrote that in there. He wrote that in there. That's great. So, I mean, just, just a comment on that. I think, uh, you know, it, it would, nothing would give me more pleasure, even though Utah was part of the electoral college that, that uh, put uh, Mr. Trump into office. It would give me nothing but pleasure to see the Utah Republicans become the uh, de facto alternative to the alt-right craziness that's going on in the GOP right now. So speaking of that, there is some interesting stuff coming out of the Salt Lake Tribune. This is George Pyle, how Romney could be the beginning of the end for the Republicans. So there's something interesting going on in Utah. They've got their traditional parties, but Utah is also this weird um, microcosm for different political parties to, to, to crop up. Evan McMullen cropped up in there and actually had a decent amount of, of votes in the 2017, uh, 2016 uh, presidential election. But here's the interesting thing. There is a Utah uh, United Utah Party, UUP, and they are courting Mitt Romney really hard. So this is from George Pyle. Here's how it can get a lot more interesting. Romney could accept an invitation presented in these pages on Friday, Richard Davis, chairman of the fledgling Utah United Party, proposed that Romney seek the Senate seat as a UUP candidate, eschewing the whole of the Republican ecosphere as irreparably tainted by the president. Bannon, uh, by the president, Bannon accused mall walking creep Roy Moore and various other crypto Nazis and race baiters. Hatch, according to some polls, is finally wearing out his welcome among Utah voters after more than 40 years in office enough so that he might be actually vulnerable to Salt Lake County Democrat Jenny Wilson. So Brian, he's advocating for maybe Romney jumps into the third party, but I don't know. I mean, interesting stuff's going on in Utah right now. So I've been following this UUP, this Utah United Party. I actually uh, signed up for their email list because I know Richard Davis uh, personally. He's a, a political science professor down at uh, BYU. He's an author. He wrote a fantastic book called The Liberal Soul that I would highly recommend. And he's politically pretty moderate. And this book uh, or this, excuse me, this party rather is a uh, is is definitely trying to shift the conservatives back to more of a centric position uh, from where it seems to be at this point. And I really think they have some good. Uh, they've outlined some pretty good uh, points, some pretty good platforms. Now I don't know that uh, that Romney's going to to go third party. If he did, he would probably get Utah's vote still, just because oh, I, of who yeah. he is, right? I don't know that he would do it. I don't know how loyal he feels to the Republican Party or if he feels at this point the Republican Party is, uh, is, is pretty much lost its way and it needs to go. I think, you know, so the Republican Party has been in power since a little bit before the Civil War. It was about 1857 when it was first organized and it was really kind of a conglomerate. Here's your history lesson, folks. It was really kind of a conglomerate between a few parties that preceded it, such as the Whigs and the Free Soilers and other groups uh, that supported its causes that were all pretty, at the time, pretty progressive causes, such as abolition of slavery, right? And they, they would debate about how to do that. Um, the Whigs were, were one of the, the largest parties of its day, and they were really created in response to Andrew Jackson. Uh, ja Jackson was the founder of the Democratic Party, and that was in the 18, about, you know, 1829, 1830, right? And the Whigs came about shortly thereafter, as a rejection of Jackson and Jackson's Democratic Party, right? So eventually they merge into what's called, you know, the Republican Party in 1857. Incidentally, I think it's interesting to note that both slavery and polygamy were part of their original party platform. So Mormons, you know, Mormons were, uh, were being targeted by Republicans at the very beginning there. Oh, the irony. But Isn't it's very interesting. But at any rate, we get this notion, and I know I'm bird walking all over the place. Let me bring this back. We get this notion that these parties are the only two options that we have and that, they, and that they've been around forever. And when you look at America's history, I mean, yeah, they've been around the longest. There's no question. They've been around now since Civil War and pre-Civil War days. But there's really no reason why we should only have these two political parties, Right. That, yes. And I know that that's something that people have been advocating for for a long time. And I think that the only way that's going to happen, um, I, I actually thought that we were probably closest with, uh, with Ron Paul in 2008, maybe even 2012. Um, it's, it's just not the case. So I, I, don't see, I don't see Mitt Romney being that passionate about third parties to be able to jump on there. I, Unless I, his distaste for the Republican Party continues to grow based on the direction that it's going. Uh, so rather than 
trying to fix the Republican Party or trying to bring it back to a little more of a rational center position, maybe he's going to say it's time to just abandon the party altogether. I doubt it. I, I, I doubt it too, mostly because you'd have to have a, a decent, if you want to retain any sort of power and not just make this uh, the, the hill you want to die on, you'd actually have to have a decent conglomerate to go with you. And maybe, hey, maybe that's the case. Maybe you've got people like Evan McMullen and Jeff Flake and, and maybe Mia Love and others, but I'm also sitting there going, not a lot of heavy hitters there other than Mitt Romney. And maybe that's all you need. I, I, I don't know. I don't know, but we're getting closer to the elders of Zion uh, saving our constitution, aren't we? Uh, you know, something, something, someone on a white <laughs> horse, horse constitution <laughs> hanging by a thread and stuff like that. So speaking uh, so- of Mormons, though, let's, let's, uh, let's finish up this uh, segment here with Jeff Flake because uh, uh, he, he had an interesting week, too. So Jeff Flake donated. So this is from thehill.com. Flake donates $100 to, Doug, to the Doug Jones campaign. So Doug Jones is the individual who's running against Roy Moore in Alabama. And in the memo line, wrote country over party. Flake on Tuesday tweeted a photo of a check he wrote for $100 to the Jones campaign, adding country over party in the memo line of the check and in the tweet. Jones is facing off against GOP candidate Roy Moore, who has been accused of sexual misconduct and assault by several women who say at the time they were in their teens and he was in their 30s. Flake, who announced he will not seek re-election in 2018, said that he would not support Moore before any of the sexual misconduct allegations came to light based on Moore's past comments that Muslims should not be able to serve in Congress. Brian, that's an actual thing. I looked into this. In October of this year, Flake came out against Moore based on a 2006 column Moore wrote where he said that, quote, Muslims can't swear to uphold the United States Constitution and still be a Muslim because the law of Allah, as expressed in the Quran, is supreme. You know these are the same complaints that were being lobbed against Catholics uh, and the Pope. And then same thing that was being lobbed against the Mormons with having a prophet. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's the, I, as a matter of fact, Romney had to give that influential 2008 address because of all these things, because of things that were happening. So that's what he went on to add. So uh, this is uh, more, more went on to add that Islamic law is quote, simply incompatible with our law. He went on to compare taking the oath of office on a Quran with allowing an oath of office to be taken with Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf in 1943 or Karl Marx's wow. communist manifesto during the cold war. So that is that's, that's just unbelievable. Jeff Flake is very strong against Roy Moore. And I believe Brian, the Alabama special election is on December 12th. And I've, it sounded like Roy Moore didn't have a chance. And then I want to say last week, the polls were showing that Roy Moore is starting to pull ahead because well, as soon as, yeah, as soon as the GOP started backing him and as soon as Trump expressed his, his backing and support for him as well, then you're right. The tide started shifting for him. And frankly, as soon as people started forgetting a lot of these things. And so it'll be really interesting to see what happens over the next. That's how the news works. Doesn't it? It's, it's fickle and it's uh, something shiny distracts your attention. We know better than anyone. All right. So the last story of this week, Brian, wow, it's been a big show today. This is from stgeorgeutah.com. Former Mormon bishop asked church leaders to stop interviewing kids about sex behind closed doors, petition at 5,000 signatures and growing. That's a big, that's a pretty big signature petition. It's, it's something that catches my attention. I'll put it that way. Sam Young, a former bishop in the LDS church, has started a petition to stop the practice of one-on-one interviews between Mormon leaders and children. The petition has garnered over 5,000 signatures. The petition states closed door meetings between adult men and children that include questions pertaining to sexual matters are inappropriate and may serve to shame children. Young led a drive for the petition near the church-owned Temple Square in Salt Lake City Friday and Saturday. Even if it isn't a church policy to ask questions about sexuality, Young is calling for an end to the practice of closed-door interviews that a child's parent may not be aware of. The church's public affairs department declined to comment on the petition when asked by St. George News on Monday. While he doesn't know whether the church will acknowledge the petition, Young said it has already accomplished a major goal of bringing awareness to the subject and promoting healing to those who have shared their childhood experiences. Brian, this is a story that is actually 5,000 signatures is a lot. And especially with, with something that people can be so sensitive about regarding LDS bishops and, and interviews behind closed doors, especially when it comes to sexual matters. Wow. Um, 5,000 is not a little bit. It's something that I think should be seriously weighed and considered at least. And, you know, I, I, so I have to say this, I I actually brought this story up with my wife this week and she immediately said, Oh, I would sign that petition. And my wife is somebody who never gets involved with anything that's of a scandalous nature at all. When it comes to the church, she said, Oh yeah, I would sign that petition. And, uh, and, and the reason is because she's also had pretty uncomfortable questions be asked of her when she was in her young teen years uh, by her own Bishop behind closed doors. And she remembers how uncomfortable it made her feel and how, um, 
how it made her feel kind of uh, devalued and uh, started questioning her own worthiness of, uh, of, of being able to engage in the church. And, uh, you know, so I got to imagine there's, and that's anecdotal of course, but I got to imagine that, uh, that it's not an isolated, uh, thing. One more, one more comment on this. Um, I serve in the primary and, you know, in the primary, you always have to have two teachers, uh, you know, at, at the same time I serve with another, uh, brother in the church and, uh, you know, we serve together and we teach CTR five. And if, and if one of us isn't there, we need to either find somebody to fill in or we need to send our class with another class that does have two teachers. I mean, that's, that's how strict this policy is for primary teachers to be in a room alone with children, right? This is something that I don't think should be that controversial that we have a policy that extends all the way across the board for any church leader, much less a church leader who, who does have the privilege of hearing confessions and, and digging into per very personal matters. What are your thoughts? So, okay. So I'm, I'm with you. Um, I actually think that, and, and I don't know if it's a matter of, of just covering Mormon news for the past four or five, however long I've been doing this. Um, when I was doing the news report, we always had a section that was the Mormons behaving badly. And I always used to get people really mad at me. Why are you including this in there? Uh, you're, you're just making the church look bad. And the point was I was including it in there because we can't get too comfortable with a lot of these things. Stuff, stuff happens. On the whole, and I think you and I have talked about this before, Brian, on the whole, 999,999 bishops are going to be good, upstanding men who would never even think about any of this stuff. But then there's that one. And so the question is, what do we do about that one? Because in my mind, that's the one that we should be focused on. So it's interesting. I, I've, I've had this discussion with a few people and uh, some people are, are like your wife. They say, yeah, I've, I've had experiences in the past and, and um, yeah, it really affected me. Um, some people are very adamant that no, we, we can't do that. Bishops are supposed to be judges in Zion. And how can you be a judge in Zion if someone else is going to be in the room with you? Uh, and and, and that's, the, the bishop is the only one who can hear that. But I think the problem is, and, and I've, I've actually seen this a lot within Mormonism, we're not very good at being creative within Mormonism. Um, on the one hand, we're going to have, we're, we're going to hold up like what you're doing with the primary. That's a good example of a good way that we could be accomplishing this thing. On the other hand, how do you begin to navigate the fact that the only person that, at least within our current LDS structure, that a, an individual can confess any sort of sins to is an ecclesiastical leader like a bishop or even a state president? Uh, for me, personally, I would love to give the Relief Society presidents a lot more latitude to be able to hear some of those things and maybe not serve as a judge in Zion, but serve as sort of a facilitator somehow, some way. Because I can't even imagine what it would be like for a woman to talk to a man about a sexual issue. And if that would be a little different if it's a woman talking to a woman. Additionally, I, I don't think it's a secret that I serve with the youth. Um, I... A, I don't think we should be looking at men to women. It should be men to everybody, right? Um, and I really think that what we should be doing is we should be opening the door so that if a bishop is going to be interviewing an, an individual, um, there is someone else in the room. That could be a member of the bishopric. Uh, that could be a member of, of the young men's presidency, an elders quorum president, a high priest group leader. If it's a woman, it could be a member of the primary presidency, of the uh, young women's or Relief Society president. There's so much room for us to be able to work with some of these things. And I just know that from talking to some people, they are more comfortable sometimes with certain individuals than others. And I'm not saying that the, what I'm saying is let's get creative about this. I don't think we can stick our head in the sand and say it doesn't happen. It does happen. And while we can sit there and say, well, that was just an isolated incident. I don't care. The fact is that's an isolated incident that now someone is dealing with and someone has to, that, that's part of their life. And while it didn't happen to you, how would you feel if you were the isolated incident and everyone was pointing at you saying, well, you're the isolated incident. So I'm actually, I know Sam a little bit. Um, I think that this is a worthwhile cause. Um, it'll be interesting to see if it garners any attention. It'll be interesting to see uh, what other individuals out there determine that they want to associate with him and if that's going to prevent or if that's going to contribute to any uh, additional exposure. But I do think it's a, a discussion that we should be having because I don't think we're having it because we rely too much on, well, we rely too much on tradition. I think it would be an interesting question to throw out to our audience. Ooh, that would be a good one. Let's do it. So what, so, uh, what do we got, Brian? What, what's, what's, what, how are we going to phrase the question? So, well, let's just keep it simple. Should, kids, uh, should bishops be interviewing kids behind closed doors? And we want to hear all kinds of opinions and thoughts because we're not 
afraid to, to throw it all out there. So you can hit us up, mail at mormonnewsreport.com. You can find us on Twitter at The Mormon News or look us up on Facebook, Mormon News Report, and uh, let us know your thoughts because we're intrigued to see if uh, either way, where you side. And we'll be right back with Fiona Givens. Okay, and so for those of you who are watching the video, the Fiona Givens interview is going to be on our audio feed only this week because we had interviewed her prior to uh, to cutting this video. So if you are listening in our regular audio feed, then you'll hear the Fiona Givens. We'll also put that up on Patreon as well, uh, but uh, we're going to cut right back into the show. Yep. So you've heard us talk about Patreon for like forever right? And I know, I know, here's yet another hand extended out for your hard-earned cash, but this time, this time, it's different. See, you're already interested in some of the, you know, some of the finer things in life, you know, like your weekly dose of Mormon news with a sprinkling of snark that brings out all the wonderful subtle flavors of entertainment in a very weird world. You are a refined individual, a diamond in the rough, dare I say, Brian, a pearl of great price. So why don't we add to that a little bit? As a Patreon subscriber to the Mormon News Report Extended Sessions, we spend a few extra minutes with our guests getting to the meat of the questions you really want to know. We turn the lights down low, we loosen our neckties, and we kick on the slow jams to really get down to business. If you're interested, just visit patreon.com slash Mormon News Report. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Mormon News Report and become a subscriber today. Folks, it's only a dollar. That's less than the price of a cup of, uh, oh, that's right. We don't drink coffee. That's less than the price than a cup of uh, uh, maybe a Big Gulp from 7-Eleven. <laughs> Good job, Brant. Thank you. And now for your moment in history brought to you by our friends at todayinmormonhistory.com. 110 years ago this week on December 7th, 1907, Charles W. Nibley, became presiding bishop and began implementing several financial changes, including a shift to an all cash policy in collecting tithing. So Brian, your chickens are not worth anything anymore. You get those eggs out of here. No, you go sell those eggs and you bring us the 10% that you've earned off of the sales of those eggs. We don't want the chicken. And you know, to be fair, uh, the chickens were making a mess. Listen, the one thing that they don't account into your one out of every 10 chickens going to the bishop's storehouse is someone's going to have to clean that. So unless you're here cleaning it, no, we don't want your chickens around here. And that is our show. We'd like to once again thank Fiona Givens for joining us. This show is brought to you by the Cultural Hall Podcast. Be sure to check out the rest of the shows available at theculturalhall.com. Music for today's show was provided by Scott Holmes and Brian Whitney, you edited and produced today's show. Uh, you know, I did my best, but uh, I think uh, with this live format, there's only so much you can do for editing. So <laughs> bear with us, folks. Make me sound pretty, Brian. Man, that's right. Make me sound pretty. Hey, you know, and I want to thank those who have who have uh, taken the time to to give us an iTunes review. I think we're up to 12 now. Mm-hmm, we that are. We're getting there. Eight left to reach our goal of 20. Um, also, in case anyone is wondering, we currently have 13 of you listeners who are supporting us on Patreon, probably uh, 12 or 11 after tonight's show. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully more. Hopefully, Brant's pitch was uh, hit you in the heart, right? And just just woke something in you and said, uh, you know, I'm going to support them. I'm going to give them my $1 a month because I believe in what they're doing and because I want those extended sessions with their interview guests and, uh, and I want to support them. Uh, but I just want to let you 13 patrons know we really do appreciate you. Uh, you get exclusive access to our video feed that we're going to put up. You get uh, our extended interviews. And uh, for the rest of you, please support the show. We'd like to go live on Facebook with our show. It costs a little bit of money if we went live to where we could get actual uh, feedback. So help us hit that, uh, that donation target, which is $55 a month to be exact because we like to be transparent. And we're almost halfway there at this point. So if you'd like to see our show go live on Facebook, where you can actually comment while we're filming it, uh, then please help us out by becoming a Patreon subscriber at patreon.com slash Mormon News Report. And as always, if you'd like to reach out to us directly, you can email us at mail at mormonnewsreport.com. As you can tell, we read everything that we get, and we appreciate every single email that we get. If you don't want it read on air, please make sure you put in the email. Don't read this on air because we think it's Or your important. name, right? If you don't want your name read on air, then put in, you know, just put in don't, don't use my name or something yep. like that. But we, we appreciate every single piece of feedback that we get. Uh, we'll be back next week. Next Sunday, Brian, it's our last show of the season, last show of the year, with more news, commentary, and interviews with a little bit of snark. Until then, we'll, we'll talk to you again after a while.